This is the lecture for uh, people of the promise, uh, kingdom divided lesson number 10. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we open up uh, your word to the Old Testament here, I pray Lord, that you would give us the eyes to see what you, what you were doing in, in, um, in, this, in this ancient kingdom and, uh, and give us the eyes to see what uh, you are doing today, that we see your, your covenants and your promises at work today as we look at uh, all that's going on in the world around us. I pray also that you would help us to see um, how we should conduct ourselves as your people in this world. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I am certainly uh, find it depressing to watch the news these days. The whole world seems to be in turmoil. There's the war in U Ukraine. There's prospects of war over Taiwan. Global warming seems to be uh, it, throughout the news. It's the cause of droughts and famines, hurricanes and even floods. Uh, mass extinction, feared by some. Our economists are warning of a coming global recession. Um, there are even fears of another pandemic. And, uh, and in fact, and for some of us, the results of last week's election uh, are troubling to us. Uh, people certainly debating the future of our nation. We sure have made a hash of things in this world, haven't we? I suppose it shouldn't be a surprise to us that, that this is the case. As we look uh, back on history, every age seems to have seemingly insurmountable problems. Every generation is faced uh, with an existential crisis of some type. Our lesson this week fast tracks us through the history of Israel and Judah. And we're covering a succession of kings and a succession of crises, wars and famines, genocides, assassinations. Unlike uh, today's news coverage, though, the Bible um, reveals that the Lord is deeply involved in, um, in, in all that's going on there. That God's character is revealed through the trials of mankind. Much of what happens is a response of a holy and just God to the sin of unfaithful people. But at the same time, we see his grace and his faithfulness to his promises. Last week, uh, Josh Taylor uh, made a statement in his lecture regarding God's healing of Naaman. Josh said, Naaman was not healed because of who he was. He was healed because of who God is. What a great statement that was. And yet that statement could be applied to everything that God does and definitely applies to this week's lesson. What we see here is God's faithfulness to his promises. And because he is faithful, he is preserving his people and accomplishing his plan. Now, back at the beginning of our study this year, you, you may recall that I gave an overview of the Old Testament and I used God's covenant promises as a roadmap, a roadmap through the Old Testament. These covenants uh, are the motivation for God's actions in this lesson. In the Mosaic Covenant, God promised blessings for obedience and discipline for disobedience. As a loving father, the Lord cannot bless sin. And so the bad things that happen are his redemptive discipline toward his wayward, wayward people. In his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord promised to bless the world through his descendants. Um, he preserved Israel, and we'll see that in this lesson because of that promise. And then, of course, there's God's covenant with David uh, that one of his descendants would be on the th always be on the throne of Israel. And we'll see that play out in, in the latter part of our lesson. So we've got three divisions for you. We've got a big passage, and so... We're not going to be able to cover things thoroughly. We have to skip some things. But the first division is God, God's delivering uh, of uh, Israel. There, we're going to see that in Second Kings chapter six, uh, 
through 6, 8 through 8, 6. And what we will learn in this passage is that we are always protected by God until we're not. Kind of a funny statement. But that is, God is always protecting us until it is his time for us to come and be with him. And then the second division, God guide, God's guidance, um, 2 Kings 8, 7 to 10, 36. And what, when we are going through crazy times, much like I think we're going through today, we need to be looking to the Lord because he's behind all of this. We need to be looking to him for his steady hand upon us. It will be what gives us uh, confidence. And then God preserves his preservation of Judah and Israel despite the threats that they, that they um, face. That will be 2 Kings chapters 11 through 14. And of course the associated verses in, in 2 Chronicles. Here we're gonna see that God uses his people to preserve his remnant and accomplish his plan. So if you haven't done so, if you can open up your Bibles to follow on, we're gonna start in 2 Kings 6. Last week we saw Elisha ministering to very humble and needy people. This week his ministry looks a little, little different. The people are still needy, but not so humble. He's now engaged with kings and military officers, uh, higher ups. Uh, Aram, uh, which we saw the country to the north of Israel, uh, is being antagonistic towards northern Israel again. Uh, they were at war, uh, and the Arameans appear to have kind of free reign to move throughout Israel's territory. The king of Aram uh, was actively engaged in setting traps for King Joram and his troops. And that's where Elisha, the prophet, comes in again. You see, God is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He knew what the Arameans planned. And somehow he was telling Elisha, who in turn told the king, who in turn avoided the traps. So obvious was Israel's avoidance that the king of Aaron suspected a spy among his ranks. He was furious. And for all of his cunning, Israel kept slipping away. What he learned was that Elisha was providing the king with military intelligence. As long as Elijah remained free, Ben-Hadad's army uh, would be unsuccessful. And so he was determined to capture the prophet. Chapter 6, verse 13, learning that Elisha was in the town of Dothan, Ben-Hadad sent a strong contingent of soldiers and horses and chariots by night to surround the town. Now, why he thought he could surprise a prophet who knew his every thought, I, I don't know. But the only person surprised by this army was Elisha's servant. Rising early, he discovered their town was surrounded. And thinking they were trapped, he didn't know what to do. Fortunately, Elisha did. He prayed that the Lord would open the eyes of his servant. See, his servant needed to see beyond the visible, beyond the material. And he needed to trust in God and his protection. And when God did open his eyes, he saw that the hills around Dothan were full of horses and chariots of fire. God was in control. I think this is often the situation. What appears out of control is actually in God's hands. When we succumb to fear, we are failing to trust the Lord. So if we are God's people, he will protect us and preserve us until he's ready to take us home. As the enemy closed in, Elisha prayed to the Lord again, and then he proceeded with a plan that must have come to him from the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 18, the Lord responded to the prophet's prayer and blinded the soldiers in some form. Elisha then addressed the men. He told them that they'd come to the wrong place. Fortunately for them, he would lead them to the right place at which he escorted them into Samaria and handed them over to the king of Israel. What Israel's army could not do, 
except possibly with, uh, with much loss of life, the Lord did without firing one arrow. And after Elisha's prayer, the Lord reopened the eyes of the soldiers. Can you imagine what went through their minds? Instantly, they found themselves captive and at the mercy of Israel. It was not God's plan to kill these men, though. It was his purpose to save Israelite lives. King Joram obeyed Elisha and prepared a great feast for these captured men. You see, by showing hospitality to their neighbors, the Israelites were showing confidence, albeit temporary, in God's sovereignty. In that culture, eating in one's home constituted a covenant of peace. The Arameans were then bound by their customs not to attack Israel, and they did not, at least for a time. This is a wonderful example of how the Lord can protect his people. How many times has he protected us and done so in, in remarkable ways? But King Joram and the people failed to return to the Lord. And so a more serious threat was posed to, again, to draw them back to God. Instead of sending raiding parties, this time Ben-Hadad sent his entire army to besiege Samaria. And because the soldiers had the city bottled up, there was a great famine. Food became so scarce that a donkey's head, certainly one of the least desirable parts of the animal, was worth, was worth a lot of money. Seed pods were normally the, the feed, feed for livestock, but the residents were not only eating them, but paying top shekel for them. While Joram recognized that he was not the Lord, he certainly had no problems blaming God for their predicament. The people were, were reduced to cannibalism, and, and the king was distraught over this, but not to the point of repentance. You see, rather than dealing with the real cause of God's discipline, that being their apostasy, he blamed Elisha. And Elisha had probably explained to the king the reason for their situation. Joram not only swore to put Elisha to death, he sent an officer to seize him. Elisha, for his part, was already meeting with the elders when that messenger arrived. The king was done waiting on the Lord. Elisha's prophecy was that he only had to wait another 24 hours. Chapter 7, verse 1, uh, Hear the word of the Lord. Elisha said, this is what the Lord says, about this time tomorrow, a sia of the finest flour will sell for a shekel, and two sias of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The messenger, the man sent by the king, ridiculed Elisha's claim, and the, and the prophet responded to him. This official would see the miracle with his own eyes, but would not experience its blessing. Outside of the city were lepers there. Lepers in Israel were normally excluded from walled cities. And we see an example of this in chapter 7, verse 3, where the four, four lepers were camped outside the city gate. They were essentially in no man's land between the Aramean army and, and the walled city. They, they went through their options uh, given the siege and concluded that their best bet was to surrender, throw themselves at the mercy of the Arameans. When they approached the camp, though, at dusk, all they found was that it was abandoned. And the reason being was that the Lord had frightened them away. He had caused the entire army to hear noises from the north and the south, thinking that Israel had hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to help them. They... Uh, retreated to the east. So hasty was their re retreat that they left most of their provisions and animals behind. What a feast those lepers had and what riches they gathered uh, until conviction set in and they returned to Samaria to share their good news with, with the, the residents there. You see, we are conditioned to disbelieve news that is too good to be true. King Joram, fearing a trap, 
sent out a party to, to investigate. Uh, and when they returned and confirmed the news, there was a great stampede by the people. And it just so happened that the officer minding the city gate was that same officer who had scoffed at Elisha's prophecy. He was trampled by the hungry mob and died, fulfilling the word of the Lord. When we scoff at God's promises, we risk not sharing in his blessings. And so let me give you a principle for these first couple of chapters. That, and the first cha principle is the sovereign Lord protects his own according to his will. Because the Lord is sovereign over his creation, his protection comes in many forms. It came here in the form of foiling the Arameans' plans to harm Israel. God manipulated circumstances so the enemy failed to entrap the king and his forces. God's protection came in the form of manipulating the hearts of people. He caused the besieging army to run in panic, saving the citizens of Samaria. And in a passage we didn't look at, he saved the Shunammite woman by preserving her family during a famine and then restoring what was unlawfully taken. Through a simple story and the miracle of coincidence, he worked in her life. Many of the people in these stories were unfaithful to God. Uh, how much more will he protect and preserve us? See, no one is as safe as the people of God. And I think Paul states it beautifully in Romans 8. Let me read this passage to you. Chapter 8, beginning at verse 31, where he writes, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? If God, it is God who justifies, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And then skipping down to 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a wonderful passage that is. God is our protector. So my question for you, how have you seen the Lord's protection at work in your life? His motivation is not just out of love for us, although he does love us, but because of who he is. See, the Lord has given Christ for us, and he will protect us and preserve us to the end. Now, to understand the context of our next section, we need to think back five weeks ago when we covered Elisha's spiritual failure. That was back in 1 Kings chapter 19. You will recall that it was at Mount Horeb that the Lord told Elijah that he was to anoint Haziel, king of Aram, Jehu, king of Israel, and Elisha as prophet. These three men would be used by the Lord to exact his judgment on Israel and even Judah. Here in chapter 8, Ben-Hadad was ill, the king of Aram, but he learned that Elisha happened to be in Damascus, a rare visit, I would imagine. Aware of his miracles and his clairvoyance, the king sent Haziel with this large camel train of gifts to learn of his prospects. What, what would Ben-Hadad recover from his illness? And so Elisha answered him, chapter 8, uh, beginning at, uh, at verse 10. Elisha answered, 
Go and say to him, you will certainly recover. Nevertheless, the Lord has revealed to me that he will, in fact, die. What's going on here? Uh, Elisha answered the king's question, but, but he provided more, even more information, didn't he? Ben-Hadad would not die of his illness, but he would die. And then Elisha went on and stared intently at his visitor. Some commentators think that Haziel already purposed to kill his king, and it was that for that reason that he averted his eyes. He would uh, do more than suffocate Ben-Hadad. He would, inf once he became king, he would inflict much pain and death on Israel. And this brought the Lord's prophet to tears. After grace upon grace, the people of Israel were going to experience judgment. There was no question Israel deserved what was coming. God had patiently warned and disciplined his people, but to no avail. The time for judgment would come, had come. Nevertheless, that judgment caused Elisha great sorrow. We see that uh, from, uh, also from Jesus here, be just before his crucifixion. Uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, he looked out over Jerusalem and wept at the very thought uh, of what was to come. To have God's compassion for people is to weep even at their just punishments. At about the same time, the si we see the chickens starting to come home to roost in Judah. Jehoram had succeeded Jehoshaphat as king. Married to Ahab's daughter, he followed the ways of Israel's kings, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. His reign was a relatively short one, eight years. And then he was succeeded by his son Ahaziah, who continued the evil policies of the house of Ahab to the north. Ahaziah, like his grandfather, maintained a close alliance with Israel. He joined Jotham in, a, in war against uh, Haziel, defending Ramoth Gilead. And it was during the battle Joram was injured and Haziel joined him in Jezreel where he had gone to recover. In the meantime, Elisha sent a fellow prophet to Ramoth Gilead to anoint the army commander, Jehu. Uh, uh, and we see that in uh, chapter nine, verse seven. The prophet revealed to him that he was to avenge the deaths of the Lord's prophets by destroying the whole house of Ahab, every male, slave and free. Jehu wasted no time consolidating his reign. He gained support of his fellow officers. He then took troops and went uh, to Jezreel. The, there, uh, the king saw the, the, spotted the advancing troops, but he couldn't identify them. Uh, Joram, the king, was concerned, so he sent a horseman to inquire of their identity and intentions. Twice this occurred without the messengers returning. Finally, the lookout recognized that it was Jehu from his reckless chariot driving. Joram asked if he had come in peace. Jehu countered, there could be no peace while idolatry and witchcraft, uh, while the, the idolatry and witchcraft of Jezebel abounded. There is never peace when sin abounds. God will not allow it. Jehu not only killed Joram, but also Judah's king Ahaziah. And remembering Elijah's prophecy, he then threw Joram's body on Naboth's plot of ground. And then he had Jezebel dashed to the ground and trampled by horses. What is interesting is what happened next. Jehu intended to give Jezebel a burial fitting for a king's daughter. Uh, but first he had lunch. And when he returned, he found only part of her her body left, her skull, hands, and feet, feet uh, remaining. The, the dogs had dined while Jehu had, uh, had, um, had also dined. Full, and then all of this fulfilling God's prophecy. Jehu then continued to purge uh, the house of Ahab. He did so with the help of elders and officers there in the land. 
And ra they, they, rather than resist Jehu, they chose to help him by bringing the heads of Ahab's 70 sons. He also, he went even further, executing 42 members of Ahaz Ahaziah's family, people of Judah who had come to visit Joram and Jezebel. And then finally, he purged the nation of Baal and all of the servants of, of Baal. And that leads me to uh, the second principle. And that is God is a steady guide in tumultuous times. Tumultuous times are times of God's judgment, his consequences to sin being played out in society. He delays his judgment so that some, may, many may repent. God gave Israel and her kings many opportunities to repent and to turn back to them. He showed them himself in miraculous ways. He showed himself in common ways, in blessings and consequences. And the leaders of Northern Kingdom fail repeatedly to heed his call to obedience. We see God's long suffering nature uh, toward these kings until his judgment finally fell on them. It's a lesson for us that we are not to presume on God's, God's patience and grace. King Jehu showed great zeal for the Lord, but ultimately he too failed. He failed to lead the people back to true worship of God. That's where, that's, yeah, that's, that's where he failed. His ruthlessness toward purging Israel of Baal needed to be followed up by devotion to the Lord. He, he did not lead the people back uh, to the Lord through the worship at the temple in Jerusalem, through the provisions of the Mosaic law. The temple worship uh, pointed the people to God's ultimate provision through his son, Jesus Christ. Tumultuous times are severe signs that we're headed in the wrong direction and we need to course correct. So the question for you is, how are you responding to God in our tumultuous times? God is using people in a variety of ways. Haziel and Jehu were his instruments of judgment. I'm not suggesting that we do the same. Rather, we ought to be more modern day Elishas, engaged in our world, blessing people, engaging even those as they reject God, but representing the Lord in a godless society. Now, I mentioned briefly Jehoram. He had succeeded his father, Jehoshaphat, as king of Judah. But he was influenced more by his idolatrous wife, Athaliah, than his godly father. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Fortunately, he reigned just eight years and died a terrible death of intestinal illness. Ahaziah, who Jehu had slain, was his only surviving son through Athaliah. So when she saw that her only son was only remaining son was dead, she set out to seize the throne for herself. She proceeded to murder uh, uh, her, her all of her grandsons in disregard for God's covenant with David. That, that one of his descendants should rule over Judah forever. And she almost succeeded. Fortunately, her, what I believe is her stepdaughter, Jehosheba, rescued uh, one of the grandsons and hid him in the temple. Jehosheba was married to a faithful high priest, Jehoiada. Uh, they kept Joash, this young uh, surviving grandson, safe and raised him secretly in the temple for six years. It was on the seventh year that Jehoiada executed his plan. He assembled, he assembled the commanders of the units of hundreds, along with the temple guards. These men were loyalists who did not support the queen. Together they made a covenant. The priests showed uh, the soldiers, the young uh, king, Joash, uh, uh, proving that there was a rightful heir to the throne. He positioned the unit strategically, uh, readying them uh, to defend against an attack from the palace. 
and the coronation took place during a shift change when there would be twice as many soldiers present and the temple would be very busy. All of this was kept secret from Athaliah. She only realized something was up when she heard the roar of the crowd responding to the coronation. Arriving late, she saw the crowned young king and cried treason. In reality, she was the traitor. Joash was the youngest king to come to the throne of Judah, and he reigned 40 years. And he did God's will as long as Jehoiada, his mentor, lived. But, alas, the, the, the high priest died, and it was at that point that Joash fell away from the Lord. The king's new advisor steered him in, different, in a very different direction. And when that happened, the Lord sent prophets to warn the nation. Zechariah, who had replaced his father Jehoiada as high priest, also sounded the warning. After Joash had abandoned the temple worship and pursued idol worship, Zechariah prophesied that the Lord had forsaken the king at which he, he was stoned in the temple courtyard. This horrendous event led the Arameans to invade Judah. Uh, not on their own doing, this was God's direction. With a small expeditionary force, they defeated the greater Judah uh, 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 army and, and plundered the city of Jerusalem. The Lord had de de delivered Jerusalem into the enemy's hands because Judah had forsaken the Lord. Joash, severely injured in the battle and killed, he was killed in bed by conspiring officials. And so the final principle is that God preserves his remnant despite opposition. Now, when I talk about opposition, I'm not talking about the Arameans here. I'm talking about the internal opposition from Satan and those controlled by satanic forces. Athaliah tried her best to destroy the line of David, but God foiled her through his godly remnant, Je Jehosheba and her husband Jehoiada. He used these people to guide this king and, who, who did so much good, but unfortunately, he had no real spiritual reality. Joash's faith was tied up in the high priest, not the Lord. You see, as God's remnant, our faith must be tied to Jesus Christ alone. And, and that only happens because of God's new covenant in Jesus Christ. He uh, has given us a new heart. Even after Athaliah was gone, there was still opposition, wasn't there? These new advisors took the king uh, uh, took the king in, in the wrong direction. They were not godly people, and they all forsake the Lord. In the north, during Joash's reign, there were a series of kings uh, that succeeded Jehu, Jehoahaz, then Jehoash, and then Jeroboam II. All these men did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In chapter 13, verse 23, we see, though, an interesting verse there. It says, it tells us that the Lord was not yet willing to banish um, Israel from his presence. He showed compassion and concern for them because of the covenant, his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't it wonderful how we have a God who is faithful to himself and that he preserves those he has called because he is true his word. And what a great example Elisha was to us there, to the very end of his life, being God's instrument faithful to an unfaithful people. So my final question is, how is God using you to preserve his remnant people today? How are you acting as a royal priest, a holy person, calling people to faith in Christ? See, God is always acting to accomplish his plan and preserve his people. But much of his activity is done through people like you and me. And with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father,
uh, we are not only a part of your remnant, but we, as your remnant, you are using us to work through the people of God, preserving them and accomplishing your purposes here in this, in this world today. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would um, open our eyes to the opportunities to find needs, to, to see needs, recognize them, and fill them, to work as your instruments in this dark, dark world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.